Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the <laughs> conservation aviation session. Uh, I'm Jeff Klinning, and I work in the technology department at African Parks. And yeah, I think that um, every time it comes to budgeting season, I look at our tech budget, and then I look at the line below that has the aviation budget, and I'm very jealous. But I think that's because it shows the value of aviation and conservation. You know, organizations wouldn't put the money towards these things unless they're incredibly valuable. Um, but there are some complexities to that, the remote environments, you know, maintaining an aircraft in a, you know, in a pretty remote place is difficult. A lot of the logistics, you know, a lot of getting the, you know, the right pilots to do the right job in these places. So we've assembled a panel of people who have a massive amount of knowledge in terms of aviation and conservation. Um, so I'll let them introduce themselves. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions today. It's broken up into two sort of sections. The first being sort of surveys and the second one being more of the law enforcement and surveillance section. And after that, we're going to open it up and hopefully people can just fire questions at these guys and, and we can hopefully get as much information across as, as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, morning, everyone. Oh, morning, everyone. My name is Ian Stevenson. I um, head up an organization called Conservation Lower Zambezi in southern Zambia. Um, I've worked in a few different systems with African parks in Zambia, etc. Um, most of them all having aerial support. And yeah, I've got about 25 years of flying along with protected area management. Yes, morning everyone. Uh, my name is Falk Grossman. I work for the Wildlife Conservation Society as the WCS Aviation Fleet Manager. We manage um, approximately nine aircraft uh, which are owned by WCS across various sites in, in Africa, nine different sites. In addition, we do a lot of uh, uh, wet leases, so uh, we charter aircraft in for operational purposes, and so they're all managed uh, through the aviation department, which I'm which I'm leading, and I'm based in Nairobi. But as a background, I'm really an ecologist and interested in in, in survey sciences and survey um, aerial surveys in particular. Thank you. Morning, everyone. My name is Gareth. Um, I work for Conservation South Rangwe. Um We operate an aircraft sort of in conjunction with the Zambian Carnival Program, so it's a shared uh, shared asset. And I suppose that makes me the shared resource. Um, I also work with the conservation technology department. And uh, as we all know, um, the two overlap. So I'm pretty privileged to sort of bring the two together and conservation, aviation, and technology. Hi, everyone. My name's Andrew Reed. I work for African Parks. I'm a special projects manager and I'm based in Kafui National Park. I don't fly and I don't like flying. <laughs> um, but yeah, I sort of manage the Earth Ranger and technology kind of programs there. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Gareth as well. Um, I manage the Birds of Prey program at the Endangered Wildlife Trust. I'm also not a pilot, but uh, we rely heavily on, on, on aerial support and surveys for um, a lot of our work. But, but more recently with our poisoning response work, um, we've set up this, a system uh, using track vultures that enables us to locate poisoning sites and often these are in pretty vast landscapes and, and pretty remote places that rely on, on aerial support to, to improve that uh, rapid response to these poisoning events. Yeah, morning everyone. Um, I'm PJ Roberts from Wildlife Act, uh, predominantly based in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, although we have a range of other projects around uh, Southern Africa. Uh, close partners with uh, EWT as well, working in the space of uh, vulture conservation. Um, and yeah, not a pilot, but uh, got, uh, got some experience in, in the utilization of, of uh, aerial support in our responses and wildlife monitoring as well. All right, thanks very much, guys. Okay, so in the first section in terms of surveying and monitoring, um, Ian, uh, what are the main roles of, of aviation and aerial monitoring? Right, this is um, quite broad, so I <laughs> threw a few notes down. Um, I mean, aero monitoring is just a tool, okay? So it's one of the many tools of conservation. I think in large landscapes, it's probably one of the more important tools with monitoring your areas. I, I think from my experience, it probably accounts for up to about 50% of um, identifying illegal activity in areas. So it, is a it does have a huge impact on the area. Um, it gives you, with some experience, it gives you a quick overview of an area, of the health of an area, um, sort of densities and, and distributions of wildlife, etc. Um, we use it a lot for um, illegal activity, whether it's poaching, you know, illegal mining, car carcass detection, encroachment, all of that sort of thing. Human wildlife conflict uh, monitoring, it plays a v valuable role there. Um, 
there's more and more tagged animals around um, to, to monitor their welfare and health. Uh, the planes are used more and more um, to check on animals, where they're going, if they're moving, etc. when the GPS tags tend, tend to fail a little bit more than the VHF ones. Um, and yeah, so we also use it for verifying a lot of things. So it, it might be the, the vulture clusters to go and check on them um, on a morning flight, etc. cetera. Um, patrol effort is another one that um, officers often have a tendency to try to cheat the system. So if you're out there actually monitoring them, checking on them, chatting with them, et cetera, they do actually have to be out there. Um, I think it's a good management tool. Um, we do use it a lot for, for just getting to meetings, et cetera, like that. But, and the, the lastly, and I think it's something that's quite important, is the morale of the officers in the field. For them to know that they've got aerial support above them, whether it's to, to drop rations or ammunition or pick up someone sick or whatever, that it's a real big morale booster for them. And it gives them a lot more confidence while they're out there as well. So those are the sort of main roles of the um, aerial support. Uh, great. Thank you very much. Okay, so Falk, um, what would you say are the biggest technological advances these days supporting um, aerial surveys? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think you know you can divide it probably into three kind of uh, separate categories. There, um, one is really um, around the platform itself. There has been a real broadening of of what's available in terms of the platforms. On one side of the spectrum, you have obviously the drones coming up uh, extensively um, and being accessible for a lot of park management. Um, projects. On the other side, you have uh, accessibility to much more sophisticated uh, space-borne platform satellites. Um, so I think that's, that's one where, uh, an area where we're seeing a, a massive advance. And then in the process itself, you know, I think the acquisition side of things, so the hardware side of things, we're seeing huge developments there. So we're seeing a lot of more sensors being built, um, a diversity of sensors, so away from just um, higher resolution imagery to uh, sensors which can do, uh, you know, like multi-spectral imagery is where you can really start collecting information uh, in regards to down to species level, nu nutrient levels in, in, in the savanna landscapes and so forth and so forth. Um, I think, um, you know, an obvious place uh, where we're seeing technology really kind of taking over, especially in the monitoring side of things, is uh, the, the kind of substitution of the human observer. Um, the human observer has always been a, a, a weak point within uh, the observation process. And removing him, uh, removing her, removing him out of the system with uh, high digital uh, cameras uh, has really increased. We've seen some significant increases in the accuracy um, of our monitoring work. Um, so I can, you know, I think that's where where you have um, where you have these big advances, and obviously they are co-evolving co in a way. Um, another area where you have massive advances is computing power, um, and that comes also with kind of science-driven um, or computer-driven science uh, advances in analytical methods, but also in the way how we can uh, handle and manage data. So we're getting with the with the increased sophistication of a hardware stack, we're seeing obviously a much more data heavy um, kind of data process and having um, powerful computing systems in place and analytics uh, from machine learning tools to artificial intelligence to deal with these kind of uh, incoming data sources has been and is going to become a, a bigger part of it. I think we can all agree that technology in general is is making is providing a lot of advances, um, but there's always going to be challenges. And I think one of the challenges, in particular, again in regards to monitoring, is that we have a lot of very long time series, uh, uh, especially in the African continent, from you know from the 80s and 90s all the way to 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 the present date. And that's really important to see those, uh, to provide us with some information about the trends of these areas. And so I think when you bring in uh, new technology, you, you end up with a situation where you potentially bring in new biases. And how, how do you then compare your older time series, the data you've been collecting over a long, long time period, with now new data coming in, and which has a different type of bias in it, uh, with, which has different potential errors in it? And how do we remain that comparability um, with, with all data sets? Um, and lastly, maybe in terms of the challenges, I think, you know, beyond kind of the, the basic challenges of, of, of cost, maybe in training, capacity building, um, I, you know, I think there's always a, there's, there always needs to be kind of a decision making process in terms of the cost and benefits of taking up new technology. So, for example, you might be using imagery for doing your aerial monitoring work. Um, you get you see an increase in your accuracy. 
But ultimately, your decisions you make out of that increase in your accuracy are not going to change. So you know the, the investment in, in, in bringing in new technology, but not really being able to drive your decision making or change your decision making, you might be better uh, you know, uh, um, off by investing in other sides of, of, of this process. For example, increasing your effort and, uh, and, 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 and increasing your precision of your estimates rather than the accuracy. And so those are kind of, I think, the decisions you need to make um, as, a, as a manager and as, a, as a, yeah, someone who, who's going to actually use the data uh, where you want to use technology. Because technology is obviously always very attractive and, and, and you tend to very easily just go with the flow but not really see how that fits into how you're actually going to improve your management. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, Gareth B. Sorry, we've got two Gareths here. <laughs> um, uh, Gareth, um, how do you sort of see... Uh, let's say research organizations and conservation organizations um, from a law enforcement perspective complement each other with, let's say, a shared resource um, such as aviation, obviously because it's quite expensive. So thanks very much, Jeff. I sit in a fairly, I, th I think, um, good position whereby the resource straddles multiple um, sort of practices, and that is law enforcement research. It's a, aviation is in a unique space, um, I believe, that multiple parties, interested parties, can sort of leverage it to um, achieve what they want to achieve. And at the end of the day, it actually doesn't matter what you send the aircraft up in the air for, with, you know, obviously with the, the crew. Um, whether you've got a law enforcement mission, you're in the space to be able to collect research data. Whether you're in there on a research mission, you're in the air, you, you, you're present to collect law enforcement data. And it doesn't necessarily have to be law enforcement and research for the parties that are sort of employing the asset. You could be collecting ad hoc data as well um, because you're in that um, sort of unique position. And uh, quite often it's that secondary data that you're collecting and sharing with other parties that will enable your organization or your organizations to, uh, to, to, to leverage further partnerships. So being in the air is a is pretty unique and pretty special, and it's, it's obviously costs a lot. So I always think it's quite important to try and maximize, you know, your time in the air and collect as much to observe as much as possible, um, and then you know share it as, as widely as possible. So I'd say that to those you know thinking about employing uh, sort of an aerial asset or how to employ an aerial asset, um, it, you know, the linear approach is is possibly not the best approach. Um, I would think about it as a yeah, so, sort of as, as quite a, a, a compound um, solution to not only your, your sort of problem, but to multiple people's or multiple organizations' problems. So it's a, I, th I think it's a, a, a very, very valuable tool that you can sort of apply across ecosystems for multiple purposes. Great. Thanks very much. Okay, so other Gareth, and I hope people here were able to see the Eye in the Sky presentation yesterday. I really enjoyed it, and at some points I just thought, wow, you've got a free sort of fleet of aircrafts in your hands with all the vultures flying around looking at stuff. And so my question now is sort of how do you, no, the paid aircraft, how do you use them to complement that program? Yeah, for, so for those of you that don't know the system, we've, we've effectively got um, vultures covering massive areas, over 9 million square kilometers from pretty much from the Western Cape all the way up to Chad. And um, as I mentioned before, a lot of these areas have no road networks, um, have, have low you know, staff capacity. And so turning towards um, you know, aerial support to, to assist us, um, the, the system is fundamentally designed to detect poisoning events, and we, we, we're seeing a, 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 an incessant uh, spike in poisoning across Africa for, for various reasons. But vultures are often at the, you know, they, they, they take the, the brunt of, of most of these poisonings being so, such effective scavengers that can cover such big areas. So, so turning towards aerial surveys uh, or aerial support to find these poisonings and respond to them, um, to the alarms and alerts that are, are, are pushed through various front ends um, is, is really critical. So this aerial support enables us to find and, and confirm a poisoning. Um, and then that, that support is also really critical to, to obviously locate the source of that poisoning. Sometimes it's away from where our birds have died and, 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 and actually given us a immobility alert. So to be able to find that poisoning source is, is incredibly valuable because we need to decontaminate those scenes and we also need to treat it as a crime scene to follow up on, on evidence and, and potential poachers. So it's, it's an incredibly valuable tool. Um, it, it's an expensive uh, solution to, to, to a lot of our, our um, problems out there. Uh, sending ground teams can take you know, up to two weeks sometimes to get to these remote areas. So 
uh, we've got to be also very confident in our alerts and we're putting a lot of effort into making sure those algorithms and those um, onboard sensitivity or those onboard um, accelerometers, et cetera, uh, are, are, are robust and reliable. So it's been a bit of a, a, a bit of a game changer for us having aerial support. Where we have aerial support, we've seen um, the decontamination of scenes in within a day, um, sometimes within an hour. And and the longer you leave that poison source out there, the the more the more animals that that are that's come to that poison left out there. So we've seen a, 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 a obviously a really um, brought bigger impact in the areas where we've we've got the aerial supports going in there, sending in ground teams after that, de decontaminating scenes and preventing these mass poisoning um, poisoning events. Great, thank you very much. Okay, PJ, um, I spent many years working in KZN and all the wonderful work you guys do on sort of priority species monitoring. Um, how does um, aerial support complement that or be a part of that sort of operation and, and improve your guys' efficiency? Sure, thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, so so um, a big focus of ours is, as an organization is to support in, support in the kind of wildlife monitoring space, uh, different partners that we work with, private um, communities and, and uh, provincial parks. Um, importantly for us, it's, it's, a, it's a very on the ground um, uh, daily effort being done by our monitors. Um, and, and so there's obviously instances where um, you maybe can't get to an area or you know, a lot of our work is with uh, telemetry tracking and, and, and GPS um, tracking. Um, and so when we can't get access there or um, or there's a chance that we, we you know you can't pick up signal for a for an animal that's potentially left a protected area or whatever that's that's often when we um, you know deploy the the, the aerial support um, and that you know can come in in different different forms using chopper fixed wing um, depending on what assets are available and working with our partners in that space um, so it's uh, yeah it's it becomes a, a an inc incredibly valuable assets, especially around human wildlife conflict um, when it comes to carnival breakouts of protected areas and, and the potential that um, uh, potential damage causing animals are in the space of, of communities and operating there. Um, for us to get a monitor in the air uh, in a chopper or a fixed wing using telemetry to, to pick up those animals um, allows us to be far, far more rapid in our response um, and, and mitigate mitigate against any kind of damage caused to livelihoods there um, so that's really critical but but importantly also it's a it's a challenge when deciding from a resource perspective whether you go fixed wing or chopper because your your ability to actually respond to an incident in a fixed wing um, and, and and drop staff off and get involved there becomes um, a little bit more tricky so often it's you, you kind of forced into a position of using a chopper which is a lot more expensive um, and that's yeah that's just some of the challenges we face there um, with with the the monitoring side of things, and we also from a from specifically a, a vulture monitoring perspective, we are so um, working with Isambelo Kazan Wildlife there, and they they've had for many years um, been doing fixed wing uh, nest surveys in the province, um, which we've been partnering with them on, um, and actually we've every five years deployed um, chopper to do a more sort of focused survey of areas that uh, sort of lower density species like uh, white-headed vultures and lappet faced vultures where we know where nests have historically occurred but maybe they're not being detected on the fixed wing so so we actually deploy the the chopper there um, to try and get a, a little bit more um, fine, fine scale data if you will yeah uh, great thank you very much okay andrea in terms of kafui uh, you know, how do you use aerial assets to support you in such a you know such a large landscape? Yeah, well, and um, for those who don't know, Kafu is based in Zambia, and we are quite large. We about just the national parks about two point four million hectares, and we only have about three hundred uh, ranges. And so, obviously, to try and cover that area, we need aerial support. We currently have three light sport aircraft and one um, Bell 407 helicopter. We opted for the light sport aircrafts because they are slower, they can fly lower, um, they've got quite good visibility in that. And then the Bell, we, um, we can use that to deploy teams into the field and that they're quite powerful. We also use the helicopter for darting operations recently um, for fire burning and that. So we're trying to, we've got this system called a rain dance system where you 
it sounds exciting, but you you don't really fire capsules outside the helicopter. Someone just stands there and clicks a little button and these sort of incendiary capsules um, drop out the helicopter. And that's actually greatly um, going to improve our burning area, our burning regime there. Um, yeah, so we have currently two, two pilots, uh, permanent pilots. We've got another two management pilots. Um, so there's quite a bit of aerial capacity. And then we do surveillance flights uh, twice a day with the uh, fixed wings for the uh, light board aircraft. And then um, the helicopters used on a reaction and sort of deployment capacity. Um, and I must say, like using Earth Ranger, the lifetime capability of that has really helped us sort of focus our um, like our sort of reaction times and that because everything is lifetime. So we've got protocol where um, poaching events are recorded lifetime. So then the helicopter can um, pick up the sort of reaction team and then go and deploy in the area where there are currently, you know, like a situation going on and um, yeah, and then. If a poacher's lucky and gets caught, then he gets a 30-minute helicopter trip back to, <laughs> yeah, back to the base. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to shift to section two now, which is more focused, let's say, on anti-poaching um, and, um, I guess, sort of surveillance uh, of flights as opposed to the, the more surveying side of things. Okay, so my first question is for Falk. Um, how do you approach planning um, and implementation of an aerial surveillance program? Yeah, thanks. I think um, one thing is uh, comparing aerial surveillance can produce a huge amount of data, potentially. Um, so both in terms of your spatial extent, but also in your temporal resolution, you can fly out, you can collect data on a, on a very regular basis, which a lot of other sources can't, ground teams, they're very specific to certain areas. And so and so I think um, one thing I see with, uh, with our organization in particular, but maybe across uh, the panel as well here, is that we're really underutilizing that potential still. Um, so we're not capturing really all the data necessary or the, all the data we could potentially capture to, to utilize that in the information decision-making process. And I think there's probably uh, three main reasons to that. Um, one w uh, is that conceptually, I think uh, surveillance uh, flights are usually seen as a kind of a single immediate um, objective of detecting um, actionable observations. So you fly out, uh, they're fairly unstructured. You find that the teams are not necessarily trained. Uh, uh, this, there's no specific standards to it. Um, and they, they can be fairly ad hoc. I think that's one issue. The second issue I found uh, is there's really there's no kind of um, out um, uh, you know accessible um, software to 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 support the data collection process uh, from the aircraft platform. Uh, most of the platforms which are available for data collection were developed for ground teams. And ground teams, one big difference between ground teams and aerial survey teams is that on the ground you have a lot of time to enter data, and so it's not really part of the whole development of your data collection tools. And so one thing is we've been really struggling is identifying a useful kind of data collection tool where we can collect data uh, extensively. And as a result, because those don't exist, you find that a lot of observations are, are not recorded. And so there's a really uh, underutilization on that side. The, the third thing I, I would say is that, um, you know, I think there's access to some more complex analytical kind of procedures and, 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 and ideas is still quite difficult. It's not ex accessible yet. You still have to have a lot of capacity. You have to have access to statistical packages and, and software packages like in, uh, in the R environment. They're not available uh, as yet in, 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 R, in, sorry, in Earth Ranger or in Smart. But I can see that coming through slowly as well, especially with ecoscape, uh, Ecoscopes or Ecoscapes coming up in Earth Ranger. Uh, and so I think th those are kind of the three challenges why, at least for us, why we haven't really been using the full potential. So in terms of how we are trying to, to work that in, in, in WCS, um, one thing we have started to implement in some sites is that we gather all the data we have from the ground teams and the aerial survey teams as well as surveillance teams and create predictive models as a first stage. So the first thing is we, we, we use that data, uh, incorporate uh, additional uh, covariates, environmental data, distances to villages, water sources, anything we think could be associated with a certain object of interest, let's say, for example, snares. And then what we create is we create these uh, predicted surfaces of uh, where we, we predict there's an, a high likelihood of, of occupancy or, or, or of presence of, let's say, snares in this case, that we then target our aviation assets to, to fly these areas and verify if that's really the case. 
And once we have that, so we have a second layer to that, once we have a verification, we can then use that information to strategize our, our, our law enforcement ground forces to these areas to verify and, and actually uh, add the action, the removing of the snares in this case. Um, one thing is which I think is interesting in this approach is that it then can be extended, so in, in a kind of an occupancy framework, um, which is a, is a way of how you can analyze some of this data, it can then be extended with continuous flights where you fly over these areas again, and then you really look at how, if there has been a change of occupancy, if there's been a change of the probability of encountering a snare in any of these uh, grids you've been monitoring. So we are really moving from not only informing um, or strengthening the way, or, uh, the way we strategize um, informing where we fly, where we move our aviation assets, but also there's kind of a bit of a feedback loop back into to looking at you know how effective was that action we put on the ground. So you know you might have a, a block where you have a, a ranger um, a unit for one week uh, and seeing if that is effective enough for the presence of, of snares to produce to a certain minimum threshold or if you need to increase those, those the, the, the coverage in these grids. And so it's beyond just uh, kind of strategizing where to go, but also kind of looping back into what is really useful um, and what's really having an effect. Uh, great, thank you very much. And I think um, that sort of, you know, you, you touched on um, sort of a standardization of a tool in, you know, while in flight in terms of collecting data. And that's another thing we find, and I see Chris here, um, please, if possible, that we're really excited for that quick capture, sort of yeah. whatever you're calling it. That's going to really, I think, change the ability to quickly capture uh, data in the aircraft. And I think we, we're looking forward to that. And I think it is on the, the pipeline. We're really excited. Ah, nice. This year, okay. Or next year. Ah, okay. <laughs> this year is coming quickly. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks very much. Okay. So another broad question for you, Ian. You're getting all the broad questions today. Um, how do you plan an aerial patrol? Um, in our case, so we, we don't have the advantage that Kafui has of having a chopper standing there all the time. But we do bring choppers in um, periodically through the year. With the chopper operations, um, we find them incredibly effective. They're planned usually quite a long time in advance. We've got specialized chopper teams that we train so that when they're in, they're um, with dogs, et cetera, in them. So that they're deployed in conjunction with the fixed wing. And we both go out usually um, in the morning uh, before, before the sun's up. Fixed wing first, chopper, we have our, our identified areas. We're in comms the whole way. And if we do find activity, then the chopper obviously can respond to that with uh, with the specialized team that's in it. And that, that seems to work quite well, yeah. If it's just the plane, um, we're looking where we do uh, rely heavily on Earth Ranger with all the historical data, et cetera, poachers routes. We do a lot of analytical work on the park of different times of year, where water is, where historical events have happened, et cetera, where your high risk areas are. And so we focus and concentrate on those. Um, we, I do find that, it, for example, if I'm doing a, a standard um, aerial patrol, I will put the receiver on the plane. We've got, I think it's 10 um, tag pangolins right now that are very, very difficult to find if you lose them, yeah. <laughs> And so I just put the receiver on scan. So while you are patrolling, you might be fortunate to pick one up. But if I'm going specifically, I need to dedicate a patrol to finding pangolins because you don't tend to be able to mix them that easily. Yeah. And the same with your, if you're doing welfare and checking elephant collars or whatever it is that you specifically do that. Yeah. So those are some of the things that we take into account. We vary our time that we fly mornings, evenings, um, daytimes, night times, or not night times, but sometimes into the dark and we'll come, um, we'll take off in the dark, but come back in the light, yeah. And then, um, yeah, so those I think are the main, main things, yeah. Uh, great, thank you very much. Okay, my next question's uh, for Andrea. And having seen sort of, you know, in various uh, conservation environments, you know, when you first introduce um, aircraft to, to a conservation area, that first poacher you catch with them is obviously the easiest poacher to catch. Yeah. And then you know, people adapt and people evolve and people learn how to change their tactics because they realize you now have a capable aerial wing. So my question to you is sort of how do you adjust to that to make sure you're consistently as effective um, in that environment? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, um, everybody obviously knows that, like you said, the first poach is the easiest. Um, we've actually, it's become a lot more difficult because right in the beginning, um, is particularly in the wet season when most parts of the park are completely inaccessible, the poachers would move in and literally build a camp, like a small village, and sort of send meat out with a bicycle, um, you know, and it was like a complete job there now. 
Um, but now what we've noticed is that they they know that with our aerial unit, particularly the helicopter, we're a little bit unpredictable. They never really know where we're going to just drop drop teams off, um, and even with the fixed wings flying around. So the pilots have noticed that there's been a shift where the poaching gangs tend to be a little bit smaller now. Um, they come in for shorter periods. Um, also with uh, on their drying racks and that they'll use, um, they'll smoke meat at night. Um, they're also now starting to um, hide the ash as well uh, under the brush cover and that. Um, and then we've also noticed that a lot, a lot of them, instead of coming in and, you know, in the beginning, we arrested a group of poachers with eight reed buck and they sort of moved in for a bit and they shot a whole lot of reed buck. So now they're actually tending to come in and shoot, um, say, like a hippo because, you know, there's one or two bullets. So there's more meat on a hippo than as opposed to like a reed buck or a sable or something like that. So, um, yeah, and so we've obviously continually, we have to try and be one step ahead of them all the time. Um, so we now have had to... Re you, um, usually patrols go out for 20 days after 10 days we move them and that and it's like a big team but now we've got smaller teams we randomly move them they don't know when they're getting moved we drop them in different areas we'll move them all over the place and then just sort of try and be a little bit um, unpredictable yeah. uh, great thank you very much Okay, so to, to Gareth B, um, we spoke earlier about the eye in the sky stuff, and I've seen Earth Ranger instances with clusters all over the map. You know, how do you, how do you take on all that information and figure out which ones you're going to respond to? You know, is there too much information? How do you manage that? Um, because obviously it can be very effective, but you also don't want to send a very expensive asset flying all over to every single one of those clusters because there can be quite a few. Thanks, Jeff. Um, That's going to be interesting with other Gareth here. Um, and seeing so it's his tool that he helps to develop. So just a quick disclaimer, I think Ian mentioned that 50% uh, of their findings, they're finding from the air. I'm only working on about 30, so advice is probably better taken from Ian. Um, the eye in the sky tool is, uh, is a complementary tool to aviation, just as much as aviation might be a complementary tool to, um, to eye in the sky. And it, it must also be said that aviation is, is complemented by other tools and is not standalone. It is complementing sort of your ground efforts, your park management and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's not sort of, it's, it's not operating on its own. Um, in terms of the Eye in the Sky tool working with aviation or, or vice versa, it's enabled us actually, and it's something that I have to explain to my management is why I'm flying less. And it's, it's not because I'm lazy, it's just because we, we're now able to employ a more targeted approach. So, you know, we've got better information coming in. Sorry about that. We've got better information coming in um, where we, you know, unfortunately able to spend or need to spend more time behind a computer just sort of analyzing what information is coming in and, and making targeted decisions. So yes, at the moment, there is a lot of information coming, um, you know, coming from the Eye in the Sky program, which is fantastic. Uh, when it first started, I suppose it was kind of like the first poacher, you know, when the first clusters started coming through, we'd fly to all of them and, we, you know, we had fantastic results. Um, I think as the system is getting better, as people are putting more birds in the sky, we're getting a lot more information. Uh, which is fantastic people you know birds are moving across borders and and everyone is sharing you know in the hope and i think it's being realized that people are sharing with them in turn um so what we now are needing to do is just dig a little bit deeper into the tool and not take it at face value but have a look at and i, th I think you know for those of you who who were in gareth's talk yesterday is actually have a look a little bit more at the raw data see where the birds have been not only where they're clustering um, sort of where they were in the lead up to that cluster, where they've been crossing paths with potentially carnivores, where they are, sort of how they interact with the rest of the data in your ecosystem, whether it's the water points that you've been mapping from the, from the year before, whether it's the poachers routes, you know, that you've got highlighted in Earthranger. So you, yeah, it's no longer a face value tool. You've, you've sort of got to dig in and use it in conjunction with all of the other data that you have. Um, so there's there's a lot of information. It would be really cool, I think, in future. I'm not sure if you asked this, but I'm going to ask Gareth where I wanted to go. Um, it would be really cool in future is if through the feedback loop we could slowly start developing a little bit of a you know a, a, a join between what Eye in the Sky is giving us and what the site has. So maybe whether they proximity sort of you, you take into account proximity with waterholes with with um, with stuff like that, but also maybe a bit of a 
and I'm sure it's possible, is, is, is having a look at the, the flight patterns, the time spent, you know, the time of day, and having a look at maybe what species um, are at each cluster. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, we do have to prioritize different species, and that's, that's going to help quite a lot. Um, otherwise, we're just going to need more airplanes and helicopters. Well, that was very much along the lines of my next question, which is, which is going to be to you, Gareth, is that, you know, you mentioned the fact that as we have more birds in the sky, we have more data. But what more data can also do is help you improve the model. You know, so sort of, you know, what's happening there in terms of being able to take that model and improve it so we can obviously keep the false, you know, false positives down and then make sure other Gareth can fly straight to only the, <laughs> the really important sites. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, we're developing the algorithms 24-7 and uh, with the information that we're getting back, it's a, a continuous feedback loop and we get this training data that can be really good uh, to train your models and your algorithms. Um, I think, yeah, the, the, the uh, just to mention, I think and some of the, the, the things we're working towards. So, and we've actually developed them. We just haven't been able to incorporate them into the current workflow, but um, Vultures are, are effectively quite, they're creatures of habit and they revisit sites and very quickly, I think after six months, you can see how the birds interact with the landscape and you can develop this really intimate knowledge base of how the birds use the landscape, where they feed, where they, um, where they roost and where they, where they drink. And I think those pop up sometimes as feeding alerts, sometimes even their mobility alerts. Um, if they're roosting and they, they've had a good feed, um, you, we get those um, pushing through to Earth Ranger as a feeding alert. Um, so, what we're doing now is to develop a way to is to thin out those those false positives. And I think we, we we're nearly there. We've written the system in in R, and it's 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 very effectively thinning out that that data and removing those sites. And we're working with uh, the Move App team and and the Max Planck team to help and you know develop apps to work into that workflow so that the pilots don't have to get these false po positives and fly over a waterhole with 500 vultures enjoying themselves at, you know, at a waterhole. Um, so that, that is in, in, in progress, and I think we're almost there. Um, and I think another element that is really important is, is, is establishing a, 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 a network of birds that is reliable within the landscape, and we now know what that network must look like and how many birds are needed within a given landscape. And those vultures interacting and coming into proximity is a, is a game changer for us. So especially when, in the likes of, uh, you know, elephant and rhino poaching and the detection of those carcasses, um, where birds converge on one site, um, we, we have over a 95% hit rate for, for big carcasses. Um, so establishing that network and maintaining it into perpetuity is, is really critical. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right, my last question uh, to PJ at the end before I open up to you guys to fire away questions at these guys is, PJ, you mentioned earlier, you know, the, the sort of how much of a valuable role aircraft can play in terms of responding to, let's say, human-wildlife conflict. You know, how do you res ensure that that response is really timely and re really well put together um, to make sure that, you know, kind of you can get value out of that because obviously putting aircraft in the sky is, does cost money? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I mean, a lot of the stuff that we are responding to is also a vulture related, vulture poisoning related. And so um, we've kind of found, a, a, I think, a, a balance of, of, you know, our, our setup is potentially unique in terms of the number of different landowners and people that we're engaging with across that landscape um, in, a, in a pretty relatively small area versus the, the expansive areas that some of these guys are, are operating in. And so using both a combination of of uh, building relationships and, and and a network of people who know what's going on i think is so critical and the first step in, in terms of getting that information to us so that we can respond effectively and, and quickly with an aerial support or on the ground um, and then also deploying um, staff in those sort of hotspot areas that are just doing patrols so it's this combination of making sure you've got feet on the ground that are able to then sort of uh, either respond because of, you know, maybe you're getting a, a, a GPS kind of, uh, you know, uh, warnings or, or whatever that, the you know, you suspect there's not been a much movement uh, from the birds and, and so you want to respond, but, and you know, you've got staff nearby, you can then say, please go check this area without having to, to pull in the, the, the aerial support. Um, and so uh, as a first kind of port of call, and then, and then you can uh, be more kind of 
critical about how you how you use those resources. Um, I think is really important. Um, and then also, yeah, I mean, one of our biggest challenges is is around <laughs> notifying. You know, just one one trip, we've got to like engage with ten different sort of landowners and and people, and and that helps a lot when you've got a, a sort of a, a central body that's working in collaboration with everyone. So in our context, we have the Zululand Vulture Project uh, as well as Zap Wing, which is Zululand. To land anti-poaching wing, um, and people are aware of their operations are in, involved in it, and so it makes our jobs a lot easier in terms of uh, notifying people and getting kind of information flow between on the ground and and operations in the air. Yeah. Oh, great! Thank you very much, and thank you for all the great answers to my questions. Would anyone else like to ask these guys a question? I'm just going to run out of the microphone here. Yeah. How's it guys? Thanks so much for that. Um, my question is for pilot Gareth and then to us on the end on that side. Uh, Gareth, drones can also be a form of a good form of aerial support, um, surveys or whatever. Um, do you see drones and fixed wings working together? And in, in what sense would you see that? So how would you think that would work in your in your aspect? And then you two guys on the end, um, following up on vulture clusters or any sort of species that you think might be in trouble. Do you think drones can be used for that as well? I know working in, in uh, bigger landscapes will be tricky, but maybe for the smaller smaller areas that you're working with. Um, thanks very much, Rick. I think that yes, drones are gonna play a role in, uh, I don't know if it's ever gonna be completely replacing sort of aerial assets. Uh, you know, drones are not gonna be able to deploy people, um, but they're definitely gonna be able to conduct, not, not yet, um, but they're definitely gonna be able to conduct aerial surveillance. Um, they can already track wildlife I don't know where the interference is coming from. Um, it's, so they can already track wildlife. They can conduct VHF tracking. They can take photographs. Um, they can conduct routine surveillance. You can program to, to do what you want and to look for what you want. Um, I think it's definitely going to be a function of where you're trying to roll it out. Different countries have different regulations. Um, I think that, you know, for example, where we work in Zambia, it, it's going to happen. Um, and I, yeah, I, I think that we've accepted that it's, it, it is probably the time and that there are going to be a few people pushing in that direction um, and probably in a complementary manner rather than, you know, one that's going to replace. Uh, and I think it's going to be great. I think it, it's going to provide a potential to, um, to build capacity in ranges. It's not, you're no longer going to need a pilot. Hopefully it's a, it's a ranger team with a drone that, you know, that, that would be um, really cool, I think. And um, it's, it's going to bring down the cost quite dramatically, I believe, as well. So I, th I think it's a space that we do need to watch, but probably not only watch. I think it's a space that we need to invest in. And I think there's probably some gents on the left here that can uh, give you some more information. Yeah, uh, drones, absolutely. We, we already are using them for, for some of our follow-ups. Uh, obviously, there are severe limitations in South Africa, for instance, just getting a drone in there you need your, your ROC, your remote operating certificate, plus your pilot's license. So the, legal, the, the, the legalities around getting a drone into there is quite complicated and, and, and costly. Um, but we are, using, we are using drones already. Um, uh, at the Endangered Wildlife Trust, we've actually uh, we've got an ROC, so we can operate drones and we can, we've got a suite of pilots that assist. But um, in some of the landscapes, in particular, where we're encountering a lot of snares, um, uh, we're finding that our eye in the sky system is, is incredibly useful for finding snare, snared animals and then snare lines. Um, uh, in some cases, we've sent drones to those sites and they can be three, three kilometers into the bush. So it's, it's really useful for, for picking that up and confirming those cases in quite high resolution um, and then sending teams out there uh, depending on what we find. But absolutely, um, obviously flight time is a, is a, big, uh, a big question and limitation. Um, just been chatting to to Dave Gaynor from um, from the Zambezi Delta, and they've now been working with a drone that has a 20-hour flight time and is hydrogen powered. So that's a game changer, and that's the kind of things we need to look towards. Um, probably follow up on clusters in a massive area um, without having to put an aircraft, well, a, a manned aircraft into the sky. So probably not what you want to hear <laughs> at this stage. <laughs> All right, I'm Dave Gaynor. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, no, I, I just wanted to put drones are complementary. Can I try without this? Drones are complementary, obviously. I mean, 
things that easy dealt uh, it's a swap, so we use R22s and R44s to do a lot of our monitoring, you know. Um, but I've been, I've been working on developing a synthetic aperture radar for detecting snares um, on that. And it became very clear to me is endurance of drones is the thing that's kept um, drones from being deployed as a daily management tool, you know. They can support ops, a quad cop, you know, multi-rotor can that. Um, but I just want... I think the thing is about task sharing, and I just wanted to ask you how you saw task sharing between fixed wings, helicopters, and drones. I mean, the drone that we're doing, what enables that long endurance is it's a hydrogen fuel cell drone, you know, so it has, um, hydrogen's got 25 times the, the energy density of lithium, you know, so that enables this long endurance, you know, and it's a medium-sized drone in between a military drone and like a wing tray or people that, the, uh, a drone that people use for survey, you know. And so um, we have great hopes of developing, it had its maiden flight on the 28th of February and we have great hopes for this, for being a conservation tool that will move drones into like a daily management perspective for all the things that you say. So, Obviously, for detecting snares, for bush encroachment, for LIDAR, looking at the changing tree height, carbon things, you know. Um, yeah, so, sorry, my question was preempted there is how, does, how do you see sharing the airspace with long endurance drones? Um, so, it's, it's David Gaynor. Yeah. I think that there's a few people here who would probably like to buy you a beer this <laughs> evening and, and have a chat about drones. <laughs> Um, it's very exciting to hear all about that. Um, I, th I think it's, like I said, it's no longer a, a space that we need to look forward to. I think it is happening. Um, and, and I think, at least from my side, very, very excited about that. So long as there's a tool out there that's going to that's gonna take you know, conservation forward, I'm certainly not going to be the dinosaur in the room and <laughs> hold on to my, to my airplane. Um, in terms of task sharing, I think you know, not everyone's going to have the privilege of, paying, of being able to pay for a helicopter, being able to pay for a... Um, you know, for a hydrogen cell drone. Um, some of us are only going to be able to pay for um, sort of light sport aircraft. It, it also depends. So in our instance, we have the budget for one aircraft and we've chosen the aircraft that we have because it can perform all of the roles um, instead of having the um, sort of luxury of having an individual aircraft for all the roles. As when I say all the roles, it can't you know, we can't dart from it. So our aircraft we use for management transport, we use for uh, medical support for some of the, the ranges in the rainy season, we use it for tracking animals, we use it for aerial surveillance. We do pay premium, you know, on that aircraft per hour because it can, you know, it can perform all, all those functions. In the future, I'd like to see us going to, you know, a, a, a varied fleet where we have different aircraft that are able to perform specific functions, you know, on a you know, on a, a requirement basis. And I think if you're in a, in a position where you have that, that fleet of aircraft, um, I think it's just going to depend on, the, the space is a shared space. It's just going to depend on what you need to use it for. If you're purely going out there to get location data of satellite or VHF collars, a drone is fine. If, however, you want at the moment, I don't know what the drones can do. If you want to be able to photograph all of those animals, uh, uh, you know, for ID photos and wild dogs, if you want to do snare checks and lines and stuff, at the moment, I believe that we need an ecologist in the plane, you know, with a long lens camera. So it's going to depend entirely on your task and what asset you have available and, and sort of how you, you know, how you divvy that up, if that, if that answers your question. No, yeah. I've I believe it's not going to cut down on the need for, for fixed wings and helicopters. It's, it's really complementary and it's, it's moving some of those tasks, you know, like so we gather a lot of money to do biannual game counts, you know, because um, we do it in an R44, which is 500 US dollars an hour at <laughs> flying time, you know. Um, once you've invested in the drone, the actual flying time, especially a hydrogen drone, which could be filled on site, the hydrogen can be generated on site, so you don't have logistics issues in remote places, you know. So you can change that, save enough money for a buy, you know, every two years to do a game count. You could possibly do it on a monthly basis, or a bi month, you know, every two monthly basis. Yep. Anyway, yep. No, I, th I think it's a, f it's a fantastic space yep. that, you know, is, is developing, and I, I genuinely look forward to it. I'd happily 
Trading my flying special. goggles for a, a remote control. Is any? I think one thing to add on. <clears throat> On that as well, I mean, we're looking at, uh, you know, a lifespan of Avgas sometime running out in the next 15 to 20 years, likely. And so I think, um, you know, the replacement for piston engines is not very clear. Uh, so, yeah, we have more specialization of some platforms like the uh, Savannas and the Bathawks who are potentially can use um, more gas. But so I think that there's also going to be a shift in, in, in that and, and, and uh, away from Avgas uh, engines within, uh, within the next really 15 years. And so I can see the gap left behind there is a time span where really the drones will, will also come in and, and fill in some of these, these uh, aviation support needs. I, I had a quick question, um, just going up in altitude here, uh, talking about space-based uh, monitoring and surveillance, just curious to have if you have any insights on you know, how you are currently incorporating space-based monitoring uh, and then also, you know, where do you see like the greatest improvements uh, for, for space-based monitoring, you know, uh, to come? Yeah, yeah I think one, one area we are uh, exploring at the moment is uh, using hyperspectral images um, for mapping vegetation, uh, well, actually crop changes uh, in the periphery of, uh, of, of uh, national parks. And I think, you know, I mean, the, the question in, in regards to, you know, where are satellite imagery uh, a, be, a kind of a better cost-effective um, source than, than, than aviation, I think that's where, where things are changing quite fast. You Nowadays, you, you, you get incredibly high-resolution uh, space-based imagery. And so I think a lot of the, uh, that has been really where aviation, as well as being squeezed, well, fixed-wing manned aviation has really been squeezed from the space side as well as from the drone side. But for us in the hyperspectral side of things where the discussions are going is that we really need quite high resolution um, data for very specific small areas. And we find that um, the sources we are, we're getting, uh, the commercial sources we're getting, they don't cover those areas in, in, in enough frequency, uh, temporal frequency. Um, and so that's where you know aircraft can fly a bit lower. They're not as dependent on, on, on weather conditions for, for these kind of sensors. And the resolution we get from them is, is at this time a lot, a lot higher. But obviously the foot, the, the print, the footprint itself, the areas you cover are much, much smaller. So they have to be quite fairly specific kind of uh, objectives, I believe. All right, thanks very much. Any other questions? Hi, guys. Um, first of all, thanks for this conversation. Mostly because it just reminds us all that we're dealing with the same problems. Um, and it's, we, we have a helicopter we use for patrolling and for surveillance. So, yeah, it's just fantastic to hear all your comments. Um, one issue that we deal with, which I'm sure we all do, is how to combat nighttime poaching. Um, with the exception of like doubling the heli or quadrupling the cost of your helicopter, what are other solutions that we might be able to think about implementing? I mean, maybe just uh, take a stab on that question and something we've been thinking about, especially in our Sahelian programs, is that, um, you know, that you could use either drones or aircraft. So you could have, you could have either um, uh, camera traps in very remote areas to really look at people coming in and out of these areas to get some information on that at nighttime, and especially that's when they move. Um, but I think, you know, then, and then using the aircraft or the drone as a data mule. So you fly out there, you don't send your troops or you don't send your ground uh, personnel in there because of the security situation. You overfly your, your camera traps or your, your, your sound uh, devices and, and you upload the data onto, onto, uh, onto, onto the aircraft and then take it back and analyze it. So I think you know that's maybe one way we can deal with some of this, these issues of nighttime infringements because I think just the level of restrictions and at least for the sites we work in, I don't see that changing anytime in, in the near future in regards to nighttime operations and also obviously insurance implications and all of that, which, yeah. Is there any, is there any advances in the drone technology to be able to fly the drones at night? Um, like we know that the hotspot areas where guys will be coming in at night and they come in and they come out. Mm. I'm sure they do in all your areas. So, I mean, thermal surveillance, um, those, all those options. Yeah. There's a, the Omnil that just came out with a new night vision on their drone and just like to fly for a while. Yeah, that pays for time. Um, really double. Let me pause the microphone around, guys. Sorry, just because it's a recording, so people can hear the re hear the responses. So, wait, maybe just quickly fire the question. Two seconds. Um, which 
Oh, oh um, the follow-up question, yeah. So just wondering if they, from, from the guys who are using drone technology, are, are there um, advances in, in the surveillance, nighttime surveillance capacity of those drones to be able to pick up those types of incidents? Um, yeah, so we use a AUTEL Robotics uh, drone that we just got the other day, and it's got a thermal camera on it, and it works fantastically. It's got about a... Eight, uh, 15 kilometer out and out and return range. And so we're using it with our rangers who are out on OP. If we get any short reports or anything like that, we just send it straight out and you can spot a person from kilometers away. So yeah, it's great. Yeah, and I've, I've recently used the Autel Max. Uh, it's got the night vision thermal and RGB camera on it. Um, and it's the difference between night vision and the thermal is just, incredible you're like watching a black and white movie um and it's got a long range and and it um has a lot of long flying time too so it's a, a really good new drone all right thanks very much anyone uh, one more question i think we've got time for one more question all right everyone happy um if you think of something later please seek out these guys uh one more it's not a question it's addressing um, user interfaces with the aircraft because we tried to do this in the R22s and R44s where we monitor the lions and I programmed as as easy and quick response thing and it doesn't work. I, so I totally agree, you can't fly and record incidents. But the um, warehouses do use an audible an audible um, data acquisition system. So you could say Nyala 15. That, you know, and just I'm just putting it out there. That's one of the things that we thought of looking forward to as a data input input advice. The technology is there. I completely understand the issue of be not even just being the pilot, but being in a in in, in an airplane or a helicopter and trying to record on a <laughs> um, on a sort of smart device. It just didn't work for us. Yeah. All right, thank you very much uh, for the panelists' time. Thank you.